Assalamu alaikum and welcome to all of our viewers. Whether you are watching this live um, via Facebook or maybe at a later time, I just want to say welcome and thank you so much for joining. Um, it's because of viewers like you that the Muslim Public Affairs Council is able to do the work that we do. And we are so excited to be motivated and to have you on our team. My name is Iman Ali, and I'm the Policy and Programming Coordinator for the Muslim Public Affairs Council, and I'll be your moderator for this evening. So we have, you know, speaking of teams, we have our A team with us tonight. And, you know, I'm not talking about A as an excellent, I'm talking about A as an Arizona. So for all the Arizonans in the house, we are ready to chit chat about this political kind of game today. So with election days, just two weeks away, I'm sure that you guys have been getting the, the thousands of calls, the text messages that I need one more dollar here, I need two more dollars there, give money when you can, pick up the phones when you can, campaigning is hard, we, we know that it is. But there is so much at stake. And there is so much to say when it comes to the elections. You know, speaking of Arizona, Arizona is a swing state. And we'll talk about this fun, fun vocabulary as the night goes on for those who do not know. I'm, I'm certain, because um, it's certainly not a playground state, it's a swing state, and that means something totally different. And you know, with a highly contested Senate rate, Senate race with numerous down ballot races that we've got to give a hoot about, not to mention our presidential race. There is, you know, a lot to say when it comes to the importance of voting and why every single vote counts. And that's a big reason of why we're here today. So it's my honor tonight to present along with our partners, um, this Arizona Town Hall. And for our viewers, just sit back and listen. Make sure to keep your questions flowing because we are going to be putting our panelists in the hot seat. I don't know if they knew that they were signing up for that, but surprise, you're going to be answering a couple of questions um, at the end of this. Um, so keep those questions coming as we certainly will ask those. And so with further, without further ado, I want to introduce my dear friend, Christy Seba, who is, going, who is a, serving as a volunteer for the Arizona Muslim Alliance tonight, and she will be introducing one of our guests. So take it away, Christy. Assalamualaikum, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Iman, for that um, um, welcoming. And I just want to say thank you to everybody who is on tonight. Um, this is so critically important for our community to stay civically engaged and to be civically engaged. Um, I've been a member of the Arizona community for over 17 years now, um, so I feel like I'm almost a native here. Um, and I have um, a lot of heart in what's what's happening here with the, the political arena in Arizona. So I'm really excited to get our community out there and engaged and motivated and have them cast their votes. Um, and I, I'm just really grateful that everybody's here today. So on behalf of um, the Arizona Muslim Alliance, I just wanna welcome everybody. And um, I have the pleasure of introducing a dear friend of mine, um, Deidre Aboud. She really doesn't need much of an introduction, but I'll give a brief little, a little um, introduction about her. So she is a local lawyer here in Arizona and um, a community activist. And, you know, she's running for you know, in an amazing campaign, she's running with passion and, and heart and, you know, who better to have run for an office than someone who has actually served and worked in the trenches with our community and that is Deidre. She, um, you know, helped me with an, an incident 17 years ago um, when she worked for CARE Arizona and, um, you know, so she helped me actually um, move forward with a hate crime that was um, happening. And so she has just been in the trenches with us um, from day one. So who better to to have serve our community, our local community, the state of Arizona. Um, so without further ado, Deidre Aboud. Assalamu alaikum. So uh, yes, I am Deidre Aboud. I'm originally from Arkansas. You'll start hearing the accent come out. But I moved to Arizona in 98. Um, I actually became Muslim as well in 98. And <clears throat> I had been studying Islam for a good 10 years. Uh, I met my husband the following year and converted him. He was actually Muslim, but he really didn't know about Islam. So we had to have a lot of conversations about that. I went on to work in civil rights by chance. Um, basically it was, I was in standing in front of, of a room and People were asking questions and I knew the answers. So I stepped forward and started 
talking. <laughs> and that started the whole civil rights and, and fighting and making coalitions and learning how to represent what our beliefs are and the diversity of our community. Um, and also seeing how that is so connected to what other people in other communities are also experiencing and how we can work together to make it better for everyone. Um, I went on to go to law school because I actually had an, an incident, um, one of many, an incident with the local ex-sheriff in Maricopa County who basically told me that he, they understood the law, but they weren't going to follow it. And if I didn't like that, I could sue. So I did take the case, that particular case to the ACLU. They did sue and win, but I went home and told my husband, yeah, I think it's time for me to go to law school. I'm, I'm tired of people thinking that it's okay to say these things. And something on that that's really important, I think, to mention is I didn't graduate till I was 40. So don't think, and I'm, I'm going to be 50 in a couple of years, right? So don't think that it's ever too late to do whatever you want to do and change careers because it's not. Whatever you want to do, just, just get it done. Um, then I decided to, instead of just holding politicians accountable, which I do quite well, I decided that maybe it's time to get in to the, to the politics itself and, and start changing things from the inside. And a lot of people decided to do that in 2016, 17, and 18. Because before, I think we all just said, oh, politics is dirty, politics is for somebody else. You know, I can just ignore this. I'm definitely never going to do this. But I think a lot of normal, average, just good people said, you know, if, if all of us, it's kind of like juries, if all of us get off the jury pool, then who's left to make decisions about justice, right? So we, people started running and it was a really amazing thing. I decided to run for this office for Maricopa County Board of Supervisors because the county Democratic Party asked me to, first of all. And I looked into it, nobody ever runs for this office in this district. And it, I know a lot about the Board of Supervisors because I spent so many years in front of them telling them that we're gonna get sued for so many violations, which we did. <clears throat> One of them is the Arpaio, uh, $178 million for known violations. That's, that's the defense and fines that we've paid as as the Board of Supervisors has paid from tax dollars. And they knew about those violations and didn't stop them. And we have so many other ones. We, we had things going on in the county attorney's office. And I mean, how do you have a human trafficker in the, the county assessor's office? I mean, these are just you know mind blowing. The $300,000 fines for the correctional health department just because Maricopa County Board of Supervisors didn't wanna fix the violations they already knew about. So <clears throat> a little bit about what the Board of Supervisors does, which as you can already tell is a lot. Maricopa County is 4.5 million people. It's one of the largest counties in the country. It's bigger than a lot of states. It has five districts with five elected supervisors and they control a $3 billion county budget. They have almost 500 authorities, boards, commissions, departments, and special taxing districts, most of which, all but like six, the Board of Supervisors exclusively decides who is administrating or being on the board and what their budgets are. So just everything you can imagine, it's schools, parks, libraries, public safety, public facilities, infrastructure, all of that is under the, board of, the County Board of Supervisors. And <clears throat> The things that I want to bring to it is transparency, accessibility, and, trans and accountability. We have so much conflict of interest. Nobody knows what the office does. They, nobody knows where their meetings are, or how to access all of the really a lot of programs that the county offers for people in the county. So I want to bring that forward and represent people and actually let people get to know the person that they've elected. So my five minutes are up. Well, let me tell you, I could have heard you talk for about 30, 50 more minutes and I'm from Kentucky so we can bond about our accents a little bit later Deidre. Um, it's always so so good to, to you know see someone with with a heart and a passion who, who wants to run and there's a saying in Kentucky that y'all means all. And when I see when I see individuals like you running I think about what that y'all really means y'all means the 
it's important to have representation in the people who decide to run. And y'all also means y'all get your butts to the vo voting booth and, and vote people in who can actually make a difference. Whether it's the voting booth, whether it's mail-in ballots, we have to all do our part to, to make a difference. Um, and so thank you so, so much for, for sharing the phenomenal, for sharing your phenomenal story, because it's so important, again, to have people who aren't just in it for the perks, but in it for the works. So thank you so much. Um, now it's my kind of, I want to shift gears and introduce our panelists for the evening. And we have a fun crew with us. So y'all watching at home, you're going to have to have a good, good time. Um, I want to start with um, Isra Shocker, who is the Senior Refugee Migration and Protection Campaign lead at one of the leading international NGOs in the world, Oxfam America. Next, we have Adam, who is a colleague of ours here at the Muslim Public Affairs Council. We like to call him our walking encyclopedia, but for those of you at home, you can call him the policy analyst um, at the Muslim Public Affairs Council. And last, but certainly not least, we have Ms. Janine Sabah, who is a junior youth virtual organizer for Tomorrow We Vote. So, um, we can start with Isra, please take it away. Thank you so much for having me. Good evening, everyone. Assalamu alaikum to everyone watching. Hello, welcome. I am so happy and honored to be joining you all uh, from the East Coast, specifically the Washington DC area, the epicenter of this political uh, context that we're living in right now and the challenges that we're facing for the next couple of weeks, especially, you know, high stress over here. I'm originally from Colorado, so I can kind of, you know, relate to a lot of what you're all saying in terms of coming from the middle of America. And that's sort of what's informed my living existence as an activist and as a really proud and unapologetic, you know, Syrian American Muslim woman is having this experience of growing up visibly Muslim in a small community where you stood out like a sore thumb, where you faced, where I faced bullying and discrimination because of my uh, hijab specifically or wearing the headscarf where I was constantly told to go back to where I came from. And when I'm thinking about my experiences as a high schooler, being the only hijab in a school of 3000 students and a very, you know, not diverse town, I remember thinking to myself that, you know, I don't want to stand for what I'm seeing, right? The status quo is not the solution. And that's really what Deidre, your words really spoke to me in this way, because you saw the status quo and you said, take action against it. And when I saw that I was being attacked and sort of stereotyped and there were so many challenges I was facing just because of my identity, I decided I wanted to do work for all communities and making sure that no one felt the way that I felt, right? And no one was made to feel less than human, less than valuable, less than anything other than amazing and valued for everything they bring to the table for their identities. So I created a high school initiative where we shared our stories, where different students that were diverse in any way, shape or form that they chose as, as how they identified racially, ethnically, ability, et cetera. And we shared our stories and we owned our narrative in front of the entire school. And first we started with freshman classes, but it was so successful in sort of breaking down the walls of ignorance and having people reflect on their behavior and how they're showing up for their community that it really made a big difference. And the principal wanted us to do it for all classes. So by the time I graduated, I had shared my story to over 3000 students. Now at the time I didn't realize that I was going to be living a life of activism and advocacy and even moving to DC at some point in my life. But I recognized there the power of my voice and how nobody could take that away from me. Nobody could diminish it. Nobody could make me doubt it. Nobody could take it away in any way, shape or manipulate it to where I all of a sudden was not who I wanted to be. And I wasn't proud of every single identity that I owned. And so from that point on, I wanted to continue the work that I was doing and I'll save my college experiences and running for student government, which I believe was just as contentious <laughs> as this election for another day. But I will say that, you know, leading the career that I live now in DC, really working to advocate for the rights and protections of vulnerable populations like refugees, asylum seekers at the Southern border, temporary protected status holders, people who are impacted by discriminatory policies like the Muslim ban, which I'm personally impacted by being Syrian American and not being able to be reunited with my family here in my home where I was born and raised uh, for so many years because of this ban. I show up every day, not just because professionally, 
it's what I'm being paid to do, right? In certain capacities. I show up in every way, personally, professionally, because it's a moral obligation to do. And because I think back at that moment where when you choose the status quo or when you choose or assume the status quo will change itself, that is when you are being complicit. And that is when you are giving up on our bright future, on our hope of owning our own narratives and creating the world in which we want to be part of. So while I'm not based in Arizona, obviously I can tell and I know a bit more about the elections that this is a really important state. And this is a very important community that like many communities across the country that are all really showing up in magnificent ways. I think today I read over 35 million voters already, votes have been cast, which is astronomical unprecedented and really should show everybody that I think everyone is ready to not accept the status quo anymore. And everyone is ready to show up and do everything they can to get out the vote. So make sure that you voted, make sure your friends, your family, everyone you know has voted, talk about it on social media, socialize important dates and things and deadlines and things that people should be doing, really make the election something that is part of our everyday conversations because it's part of our everyday life. And for those who really believe that they're not political along the lines of what you were saying earlier, Deidre, or people who say, oh, I'm not really into politics, I'm not really political, which is my favorite thing to hear. I tell you your existence is political. And so whether you wanna to come to terms with it or not at this point, which I hope you do recognize that every single person that's living in the context of which we're living in right now in the US in a pandemic, your existence is political. And so you have to show up. There's no other option here. And I'm telling you there's no other option but to show up and get everyone you know to show up, especially to the polls, especially to have these continued conversations in our communities, especially in the Muslim community. This civic engagement can't just also start and stop here. It's not about casting a vote every four years for, president, for a president. It's about continued advocacy, continued activism and engagement on issues that not just matter to our community, right, but every other community that's being impacted by it. And it's about showing up for each other, amplifying the voices of those who are directly impacted, checking our privilege, knowing when to lean in to support communities, knowing when to fall back to support communities, but ultimately staying engaged because that is what we need. We need active, engaged, proactive people that recognize that this is not normal, what we're living in, but also that if we wanna to continue to build a future where we can see ourselves thriving, we can see our future generations thriving, we need to be part of that solution and to be part of that change because ultimately change is on all of us. Thank you all so much for having me. Uh, I, I know my three minutes I think are up, so I wanna be mindful of time and respectful to my other speakers, but this is so exciting and I get so hyped up you know, listening to people and it's 10, 20 PM, but I feel it's really like energetic as if it was you know, mid morning uh, to go get out the vote right now. And so thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to any questions. Absolutely. I love that your existence is political. I need that on a shirt and a bumper sticker and a coffee mug. I just, this is what we're going to be passing out for Eve gifts from now on. That was awesome. Yeah. And Isra is one of the people to our audience. She really walks it she walks it how she talks it. I think that's how the, the saying goes, you know, for all who are in DC, she is a well known name when it comes to activism, and kind of getting the job done when when you're not really sure what position to take where to go how to make it happen. Isra is kind of like the fairy godmother who who makes your dreams come true. And so we're really thankful with us today and, and as a partner in so many of our initiatives in the past. And I just want to, you know, take a minute and just think about, you know, how amazing Muslim women are. Can we just get a round of applause for so far? I am so impressed. You know, it, it's it's absolutely amazing how motivated and how, how you know, inclined to leadership um, women in our community are. And, and I'm behind this movement, man. But speaking of Muslim women, um, we're going to bring Adam in, who is, you know, not a Muslim woman, but just equally as awesome and behind the cause, absolutely. Um, so Adam, go ahead, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Iman. Uh, well, we do have two Syrians on the panel. I'm Syrian, as for Syrian, so we're, we're representing. Let's, let's give it up to Syrian uh, Muslims <laughs> and Syrians. All right, excellent. So thank you, Iman. Thank you to everybody who's joined us. I have the pleasure of kind of sharing with everyone here some insights and perspectives from our Tale of Two Futures project. Um, which is MPAC's contribution to the coalition building and political engagement work that's sort of surrounding this election. Uh, to start, uh, you can access the paper and some of our other election related events and resources at taleoftwofutures.com. Don't worry, like every good salesman, I'll repeat the link at the end of my piece as well. I'm sure they'll put it in the chat. Um, 
So basically, Our Tale of Two Futures paper uh, tries to clarify a challenging and complicated political landscape explicitly for the use of American Muslim civic organizations and our allies, many of whom are, all of whom are joining us this evening. Um, so to do this, we wanted to understand how, maybe they put it in the chat. So there, to do this, we wanted to understand how both political parties engage the issues that are relevant to the community and, our, and to our allies. So to identify those issues, we refer to the litany of uh, external polling, internal polling, and while also taking stock of the political moment in which we now operate. Uh, so we decided on the following issues, uh, epidemic insecurity, criminal justice transformation, immigration, civil and human rights and civil liberties, and the future of our district and federal courts. For all the in-depth stuff you, you should refer to the paper, here I'll gloss some of the high-level takeaways. Uh, to answer the much more political, uh, complicated question of how parties engage these issues, we, we borrowed from two approaches that I have found particularly useful myself. Uh, the first is an approach from Stephanie Mudge, a professor at UC Davis, who understands modern mass parties as essentially prisms. Their actions do not reflect what is internal to them like a mirror, but they refract their internal components. The three core components of modern mass parties are the fields or networks of people that handle their most important functions. That's fields that establish facts of the matter on given issues, fields that mobilize constituencies, and fields that seek and ultimately win uh, political office or other sorts of power. I think we have all, all three fields represented here uh, in this town hall. The other approach is called political articulation. Uh, it refers to the ways that parties take actionable steps towards the issues, like the issues we, or I, I already mentioned, by recognizing some collectivities of people as legitimate representatives of constituencies and engaging them as such. So you can identify in this gloss uh, two sides to the coin parties in society. Parties are made up of these three principal fields and members of civil society have to work to build the coalitions that are broad enough to earn their way into those fields, to be the legitimate representatives of constituencies and to move the needle forward on the policies that they work on. So for what it's worth, uh, parties have to let us in when we get there, right? This is the actual substance behind the well-worn phrase, let others have a seat at the table. But uh, how can organizations like ours and our allies use this tool for the achievement of our collective goals? I think the first thing to understand is that the American Muslim community is not a monolith, but is rather one of the most diverse socio-political blocks in the country in terms of race and ethnicity, as well as socioeconomic status. Now this uh, hardly need divide us. Uh, rather, I think it underscores the point that there, are, they, there exist solidarities between American Muslims which cross social, political, and class differences. To name just one, uh, alleviating poverty is a primary focus of charitable giving among the more affluent uh, American Muslims, just as it is an issue of self-interest for the one third of American Muslims who live at or below the poverty line. This is just one example of the many things that link American Muslims to one another and to our allies and to the candidates that are here today to make their cases and to ultimately try to win the support of the constituencies necessary to win elections. So our task is to facilitate the group solidarities needed to address our shared concerns. This is the hard work of earning our way into the political coalitions that make up the core of the party. So that when you shine a light on the American party system, you see the American Muslim voice refracted back at you. So thank you. You know, one of my favorite things about this project is the title. You know, aside from the message and the mission that we really do, Tale of Two Futures. One of the things that I think all of your political friends, all of the people who are, you know, hounding you to vote, people who are just inclined to, to, to care, which should be all of us, by the way, but for those of us who kind of, you know, wake up in the morning and we're eating, you know, politicos with our, you know, milk or whatever, I think it's recognizing the fact that this election, more than any in the past, really dictate what our future is going to look like right and the future depending on who is in office will be drastically different than what we could ever imagine right so make your choice knowing that your vote is not just a favor to someone trying to get into the white house or to congress it's a vote it's it's a speech it's a comment saying this is the future that i want you know, it might not be perfect, but it might be better than what the other person's offering. So keep that in mind as we as we progress, as we get closer to election day. Now, next we have Miss 
Janine Seba, and I don't want to take a second longer. So please go ahead, Janine, the, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. My name is Janine Sabah. Um, I'm a 17 year old Palestinian American who's found an interest in the political process and getting people throughout not only our state, but our country politically engaged. I'm currently working for an organization called Tomorrow We Vote. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that focus on, focuses on registering young people to vote as well as allowing them to understand their power within the political process. Our community is known for being filled with immigrants from different countries and ethnicities, all these different races come together to form the Muslim community. As a minority group, we are subjected to many issues across the board. Although not all of them can be remedied with voting, there are a number of them that can be. Although our election is slightly controversial and people constantly sit out due to not liking any of the candidates, it's important to remember that if you don't vote, someone will vote for you. Contrary to popular belief, your vote counts. Although many people believe that your vote is invalid within a sea of others, that's quite untrue. Every vote counts. And although I'm only 17 and unable um, to participate in this election, I'm encouraging you to make sure that your voice is heard. When, you're, when you vote, you're able to control the narrative. You have a say in what's going on around you. Regardless of whether you choose to vote in this election or not, the outcomes will impact you regardless. They may even determine the next three decades as it takes time to undo any changes that you may not agree with. Although you find, may find it tedious to wait hours in line just to get the I voted sticker, that sticker means something much more. It means that you put yourself out there to change the narrative and control what politics are being put in place and may directly or indirectly impact you. Make sure to cast your vote as our community is depending upon it. Listen, I wish that I had half the gall that Miss Janine did at 17. I, I'd be running my own campaign by now. Mashallah, that is amazing. You know, she can't even vote yet, but she is embodying exactly what our faith really says. And that says to take care of your neighbors, to make sure that justice and equality is really booming through the, the spaces that you're in. So mashallah, Janine, you know, I have a young, I have two younger sisters and I'm going to have to send them your way because you are just an inspiration for all. And I know in the next four years, in the next year, when you start voting, this world is going to be a better place because of people like you who care. So thank you so, so much for that. Um, I want to kind of end with, with our candidate, Deidre, to kind of close us off. Um, if there's anything more that, that you'd like to say, the, the floor is yours. Just go ahead and unmute yourself. For it. There you go. There we go. Just a couple of things. One is, you know, every vote does count. You know, we, I remember almost 20 years ago when I was in civil rights and social justice directly and trying to get people to register to vote within our community, the, you know, we were still arguing about can Muslims vote? You know, is, is that, is that um, halal? Is it kosher? Is it, you know, is it, is it okay? You know, and you know, it's, it's like, well, you live here and they're making decisions for you. So you might ought to, you know, have a say. Um, but uh, the second thing that I always heard was that they only voted during election years of the president, you know, and local affects your life so much more intimately than the president. You know, it's, it's where the shiny thing at the top of the ticket is only one thing in this puzzle of what affects your life politically, your local community your local governments are what decide a lot of the discrimination policies, a lot of the uh, zoning. I mean, so many mosques trying to, you know, just build a mosque or they, they want a crosswalk, you know, I mean, that's, that's your local government. And some of the conversations we've had a, 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 with local governments before about why we can't have a crosswalk at a, at a mosque have, have been extraordinary. You know, we, we need to have informed elected officials as well, but we have to, go and form relationships in order to inform them. And lastly, the every vote counts. In Arizona, at some of our local races, especially state legislature, won and lost in 2018 by less than 200 votes. When you get even closer, like city council or school board, all of these things are so important. They're often determined by less like less than 50 votes sometimes. We've had races in the United States that were literally determined by one vote. 
So every vote does count as long as you're looking at your local community because that's what really counts anyway. Thank you so, so much. And listen, I'm going to need some yard. I'm, I'm in Kentucky I'm about a thousand miles away, but I'll put a yard sign for you because that's how much I believe in you. And thank you so much for putting yourself out there for, for explaining how, you know, this isn't just a them issue. This is a, a we issue. We all have to care. We all have to do our part. And, you know, it, it gives me a lot of solid future includes leaders like Deidre and Janine and Isra and Adam. Um, and, and, you know, thank you so, so much to each of you for, for joining us so, so much. We're going to, we're going to move on now to, to our next segment with our, um, our president. He didn't get elected, but by all means, he's doing a lot of work here at, at MPAC. Salam al Mariati, who needs absolutely no introduction aside from the fact that MPAC is so, so lucky to have him. And I myself am so lucky to have a mentor like him um, who, who cares and has, has informed me so much about the political process. So without, uh, Salam, please take the, take the stand. Thank you. Thank you, Iman. Uh, Bismillah rahman rahim Salam alaikum to everybody. And we're very uh, proud and lucky to have Iman uh, leading us in, in, in this front and so many uh, other fronts. Uh, the young talent at MPAC always amazes me. Uh, Adam writing that Tale of T Futures. I don't know if you've read that paper, but you need to read it. Uh, it, it, it it's uh, received great reviews from uh, political leaders all across the, the country. Um, Taking up what Deidre was talking about in terms of, you know, how, you know, just years ago, people were thinking that voting was haram, um, that it is forbidden, uh, that we cannot be involved in any political system. Uh, number one, if you pay your taxes, you're, you are in the system. And voting is simply a means of ensuring that our tax dollars goes towards the values that we represent as Muslims. And those are the values of justice, of compassion, of mercy, of freedom. And most importantly, as was stated in the Quran, God has bestowed human dignity on the children of Adam. Islam delivered human dignity to civilization 1400 years ago. And we have that same battle today to deliver human dignity to those who are locked up in cages, to those who are driven through a prison pipeline, to those who don't have the opportunity that you and I have. We are the privileged and our responsibility is, serve the, is to serve the underprivileged. So when the Quran says, and you give your money for the love of God to the orphans and the needy and the refugees and those who are stuck and those who need liberation, there is no better way of doing it than to ensure that our tax dollars, our money is used for those purposes. And that is how I see the Islamic obligation towards voting and towards political participation. We are nothing if we do not register to the American public in terms of our values. We are just a shell uh, of rituals and chants that people won't understand and we become irrelevant. So to me, it's a matter of our survival and for the cause of Islam enriching America with the contributions of American Muslims. Uh, number two, uh, as again, as Deidre was talking about, you know, politics at the end of the day is a big business. It is the biggest biz business of America. $800 billion goes to the Department of Defense every year. Uh, as Deidre mentioned, $3 billion is controlled by the Arizona Maricopa County Board of Supervisors. You control services. You control how it's directed and where it needs to be directed. You control how you can employ people and how people who need employment will be served uh, by these tax dollars. And finally, we are 1% of the population and the time to make the impact of 1% is during the election because that is when the swing vote counts the most. 1% may decide the election throughout Arizona. 1% in Arizona may decide the election for the rest of the country. And so this is the time to register 
the one uh, the one percent and to get out the vote. So let us unite and put aside our differences. You know, there's so many times that we get into, you know, because I'm from this part of the world and you're from that part of the world of I'm indigenous and you're immigrant or I'm liberal and you're conservative, then we can't work with each other. We have to put that aside. Uh, unity is not about conformity. Unity is about managing our differences of opinion. And who is the best person to manage differences of opinion other than our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, for delivering mercy to us and bringing people together who were warring with one another, who were, who were committing acts of violence, gang violence at that time against one another. And yet he was the peacemaker and that is how we see American Muslims contributing to America by being those build, uh, people who build bridges of understanding, not destroy them, by uh, preserving human dignity for society and by peacemaking as well. So that is how we see uh, our role in this election. And I'm so proud to be with all of you. And I'm very, very proud to be with Isra Shakur, uh, one of our advi you know, initial advisors for MPAC um, uh, years ago. Uh, and I'm also proud to be with all of you in Phoenix. I don't know if you know, but I am. Uh, I I grew up in Tempe, Arizona. I I I I went to high school at McClintock McClintock High School, uh, and my father uh, went to Arizona State. So I'm I'm a, an original. Uh, uh, by the way, I'm I'm more of a Phoenix Suns fan than I am a Lakers fan, even though I live in Los Angeles, and I always root for the for my Arizona team. So. I'm so glad that we can reconnect. And I thank uh, Sohaid Sheikh uh, for connecting us with all of you today. So let's go on with the program. I wanna introduce um, one of uh, the most uh, uh, astute uh, members of the US Congress uh, from Tucson, Arizona, down the road. Uh, and we love Tucson, even though I am from uh, Tempe and, and we're rivals between ASU and the U of A. But, uh, when it comes to this issue, we uh, are, are, nothing separates us, not a ray of light separates us. Uh, Representative Raul um, Grujalva is the highest ranking member uh, out of our Arizona delegation. He's the chair of the House Natural Resources Committee. He serves on the Committee on Education and Workforce and is a co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Congress, con uh, Caucus. Uh, he's a longstanding member of the Congressional uh, Hispanic Caucus, and uh, we'd like to welcome Representative Raul Grijalva. Um, thank you very much, my friend, and uh, and thank you for the fine work that organizationally and yourself and uh, the fine advocates that you have uh, do at a national level to make sure that we deal with the questions that were part of your discussion and preamble when you started speaking. I, um, I'll be real quick and then maybe there's other members that are going to be here or there's going to be questions. Uh, we can go to those sooner. I, I, I think um, as I listened in, I think much, much of what I wanted to talk about is, has been discussed. And that is the urgency of the moment that we're in and as a country. And, uh, and the identity of this country going forward. I think that's the election in a nutshell. Uh, uh, what, not only coming out of this pandemic, uh, but coming out of the, these last four years and the political times that we're in, uh, what kind of identity is this country going to have? And, and I think that that is why this election is so consequential because it is to some extent defining that identity for uh, for, for, for generations to come. And I think that's, that's, that's the, the most uh, critical point that I wanted to make, why every vote counts. So I mentioned the 1%, perhaps, okay? But this election is going to be close. It's gonna be close in Arizona, it'll get closer. And so that it's not, a, every vote is gonna be critical and every vote will be a, a, a vote of leverage. Uh, to, to find the winner. And, and, you know, I'm a partisan. I'm supporting Biden Harris and I'm supporting the Democratic uh, Party. And, and whoever wins this election, I think is going to define this, uh, this identity, both at the local level and at the national level of this country. 
And, and what have we seen? I think we have to, I think the Muslim community and Islamic community uh, know what's at stake in this election more than, uh, than many communities. Uh, and the litany is there in front of us uh, without the Muslim ban. The 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 the, uh, the the restricted and reduced immigration quotas uh, based on religion and race that this administration has implemented. Uh, the uh, the completely upending uh, the history, uh, the tradition, and the precedents that be, had been set around, uh, and basically uh, not following the law with regards to asylum seekers and refugees and, and the process for credible, uh, uh, credible fear uh, that need to, be, uh, need to be honored by this, uh, by this country uh, as we've honored it through our history. You know, uh, America is a, is a first generation American myself. You know, uh, uh, America is, uh, is, uh, is defined by, by, uh, by this immigrant, uh, immigrant history, that's part of its identity and, and efforts to whitewash that away as though it never existed. Uh, not only is historically sinful, but it, 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 it affects all of us in the present. Uh, and, and I say that because uh, I mentioned those two things. I mentioned ch children to the cage. I mentioned, I can mention the, 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 the stoking of fear and division in this country where we're, uh, we're being taken up to a cliff where there's two Americans and not, not one America, and 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 what the and our and this country as a democracy and a representative government, electoral politics are part of it, and voting is part of civic participation and, and civic literacy, uh, and and because that's where opinion is stated as to who should represent you, and where you want this identity of ours defined and how you want it to go forward, period. And, and many of the values and traditions that have been developed as, in this country, because this, this country has historically has its warts, has its blemishes and has its scars. And uh, around social justice, around the treatment of indigenous people in this country and the ongoing battle for equity and, and equality in this country that is ongoing and constant. But that's, working toward a more perfect union. And, and we need to continue to do that. And I have optimism and faith that the values and traditions of this country are gonna get us there. Uh, and, but that's what's at stake in this election. I, uh, you know, our, 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 this country, we share some holy books, some holy testaments. That's the Bill of Rights in our constitution and our ability to, to vote. We share those. And, 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 and I think to protect those and to protect and, uh, and, and take care of those that are more vulnerable in this country is, 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 uh, is what we should be about. We're gonna come out of this pandemic, but what kind of country are we going to be? Uh, I don't think the status quo as we are now can be replicated and say that everything is okay. I think we have to come out of this better. And so this vote will help decide a lot of that. And I, I, I would encourage the work that you're doing, obviously, uh, but I think people know that. We just need to remind them and when necessary, motivate them to, to, to use that. And I, I hope that the next conversation that we have after the elections is about going forward, repairing some of the damage that has been done and talking about um, how we get back to the mentality that this is one America, that it's not two Americas. With that, let me turn it back to you, my friend, and, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Grijalva. And, and um, we, we are touched by your words and bringing us in your fold is such an honor. Um, and uh, as you stated, it's, it's about defining what America is, what this election is about. And it's about e pluribus unum. From many, we are one. It's about pluralism. It's about diversity. It's about how this country was made uh, by immigrants um, who came from every part of the world, not just one part of the world. Uh, it's about our Native Americans and how, unfortunately, they were displaced and they were 
um, decimated, uh, eliminated, and and we have to reconcile with that as well. So thank you very much for reminding mm -hmm. us of these important things as we try to perfect this union. Next is uh, our representative from Tempe, Arizona, my hometown, um, uh, Greg, uh, Congressman Greg Stanton. He's a member of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee and the Judiciary Committee, very important committee. The Judiciary Committee uh, covers a lot of these issues as it pertains to how law enforcement um, ha is regulated uh, throughout the, the country. Uh, and this Congressman is there as our eyes and ears in terms of those issues. He's also the former mayor uh, of the city of Phoenix. Please welcome the Honorable Greg Stanton. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you for uh, having me on today. It's so great. And uh, to hear those wonderful words by my colleague, uh, the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee, the dean of our delegation, Raul Grijalva. I don't know if he jumped off the call because I'm saying nice things about him. So I want to make sure he hears me say those nice things about him. <laughs> He's a great partner. And I see Ruben Gallego on the call as well. He is going to say a few words in a moment. He's a great uh, uh, speaker and uh, he's a great friend and uh, I just love serving with these folks in Washington. I see Deidre Abowd also on the call and she's an awesome leader in Arizona and uh, she has a place at the leadership table. So thank you for being such a good leader and educator of the community, Deidre. Thank you for all that you uh, do. I have very little to add to what the our, the dean of our delegation said, Congressman Grijalva, and I know this is probably a bipartisan uh, audience, so I don't want to go too far to one side uh, or the uh, uh, of the spectrum. But I have my own personal values, and uh, my values are represented in my politics and and who I choose to associate with and how I choose to vote. And obviously, I happen to be a member of the Democratic Party, and I do believe that when the 1% of our society represented by the Muslim community votes in huge numbers and votes your values, uh, I do believe we are gonna see a significant change in this country, significant change in the White House. And I do believe there'll be a change in the United States Senate and we can move forward on so much more positive things. First, obviously, uh, is the response to the COVID crisis. The United States has responded worse than any other country in the United in, in the in the world. Uh, sadly, we have the, by far the largest number of cases and the largest number of deaths, uh, even by uh, population. And you know, I want the United States to have the strongest economy on planet Earth, but this is hurting us badly. I just read a report that China is doing so much better than we are in fighting this COVID virus, and therefore their economy is now advancing much more quickly while we are still behind. Uh, and that's one of the biggest reasons why we need a change in the White House is to get a responsible leader that will follow the science and let us crush this virus and move beyond this virus and get back to building the strongest possible country that we can. And I believe our long nightmare is almost over as it relates to uh, our self-defeating and dehumanizing border policy, particularly as it relates to separating children from their families. And we just saw the sad, sad report that over 500 children that were separated from their families, we can't even find their parents to try to reunite them. Um, and that's a shame in and of itself and also a shame about how the rest of the world will view the United States, that we would engage in, you know, how do we talk about human rights in other countries where we have engaged in that policy here in our own country. And was mentioned by Chairman Grijalva, the Muslim ban that goes against all of our American values. I was so lucky when I was mayor and a bunch of uh, governors around the country, including our own governor here in Arizona, tried to have a Syrian ban, a ban on all people leaving war and uh, terrible activities and violence in Syria, and they were looking for a safe place under uh, international law and under even our own refugee laws. And uh, these governors put out the word saying they were that Syrian refugees were not welcome in America. Well, as mayor, I said, au contraire, in Phoenix, Arizona, you're welcome. Uh, it's a thing of pride that we welcome people is, you know, who are escaping 
war and violence in our city. And it makes us a stronger city, it makes us an empathetic and compassionate city. And ultimately, uh, it makes us a better community. And so uh, I was proud to go against our governor very publicly during that difficult uh, time. And of course, now we see it at the federal level with regard to the Muslim ban. And uh, that's why I'm so proud of serving with uh, Grijalva and Gallego, because in addition to the to uh, the things that directly impact the Muslim community, this is a community that stands up for civil rights and civil rights for everyone. Because you know that when civil rights advances for any particular group, it advances for everyone. It makes us a stronger country. And so that's why I'm proud to serve on the Judiciary Committee. And we did advance very important bills that did pass the United States Congress, including um, reinstatement of the Voting Rights Act, because we believe it's it should be a lot easier to vote in the United States of America. And I know this community agrees with that. We believe that the United States is stronger when more people participate in our democracy, even people that happen to disagree with my particular philosophy. I want them to vote because this is a democracy. And when more people participate in the system, it makes us all stronger. I'm proud of serving on a committee and, and with a party and with these two other outstanding Congress members that support the DREAM Act for our young dreamers who are represent such a bright future for our community to give them a path to citizenship and not be afraid that DACA is going to be eliminated and therefore these young people are subject to deportation. That goes against American values. And we do support comprehensive immigration reform, just like Senator McCain did not that many years ago. And we do support equal pay uh, for equal work for women. That's why we supported the Paycheck Fairness Act. And we do support the Equality Act, which puts our LGBTQ community, our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters, fully in, into the civil rights laws of the United States of America, because they deserve to be protected in housing, employment, and in public uh, accommodation. And we do support passing a gun violence legislation to, to stop this, this horrific gun violence that we see and have universal background checks and red flag laws. These are, these are universal values that I believe that most people on this call and most people in America would agree with. It's time to pass the, vote, the Violence Against Women's Act. All of these things have passed the Congress with the support of Grijalva and Gallego and have died in the Senate. And I'm so excited about this upcoming election because bills like I've described and so many more will now have an opportunity to have a full and fair hearing and a vote. So this community, more than almost any other community understands the importance of advancing civil rights in this country. And that's why so I'm excited that the Muslim community is putting this event together and every single person on this call, if they haven't already voted, is gonna vote tomorrow, assuming you have your ballot. Don't hesitate, get that ballot back in. And then you have the real work at, thereafter to try to get every single person you know to participate in the election. I may have just lost you. No, we're with you. Okay, you. I, I lost yeah. the screen here, have, sorry. And just to let you know, Congressman, we have leaders on this call who have access to thousands of people. So your message is definitely um, um, uh, you know, uh, broadcasting to the whole community and, and energizing us to, to get out the vote. All right, well, I've lost you on my screen. Can you see me okay? Yes. All yes, right, we well, then I'll just keep winging it. But you know, the point really is, is that uh, that's our responsibility as leaders. Everyone is called as a leader. Vote yourself and then your work ain't done. Roll up your sleeves and get every single person you know to participate in this election. Yes, even people that might disagree with you on who to vote for. When more people participate, it's great for our democracy. So I'll stop there and listen to um, Congressmember Gallego. And I think we're, we may take a few questions thereafter, is my understanding. Yeah, we're going to take a few questions. So please, everybody, prepare your questions for... Uh, our members, and uh, we'll now introduce Representative Ruben Gallego. Uh, he's uh, the uh, assistant whip for the Democratic Caucus, and he's the ver first vice chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. Um, he's also a member of the House Natural Resources Committee, where he serves as chairman of the Natural Resources Subcommittee for Indigenous Peoples of the United States. Welcome, Congressman. Well, thank you. And, and since we're taking questions, I don't want to uh, uh, do this too long. I just want to make sure we take as many questions as possible. 
Um, and I apologize, I don't know why I have this red tint uh, on here. Uh, must be because I'm uh, doing uh, the Zoom at night here. It's the first time I think it's probably this, this way. Look, I, you know, I can't really um, expand more than what Congressman Grohal and Congressman Stan already uh, has, uh, have already done. You know, clearly this is a uh, campaign or this election, I would say, is an election that needs to go in the right way. I think it's a, we are currently in an existential threat to democracy. And I think that is particularly important for everybody, but I think it's also important more so even for minority uh, religions in this country. Uh, the type of rhetoric that is being used right now by the right uh, and by the politicians in power, whether they are using crypto language or just outright anti-Muslim language is very dangerous. And I see it both in um, disinformation that is being passed around all the time on social media, but also see it coming straight from the mouths of Republicans uh, and other politicians uh, in uh, Congress and in politics. Uh, and I think the most important thing we know from history, if a politician tell you, tells you who they are and what they're about, uh, believe it, because uh, you know, you're, it's always a best bet. And we only have to see how this administration started running on the Muslim ban, trying to implement a full Muslim ban, still being able to implement a, you know, watered down Muslim ban, but still insulting even today to this day. Something that I find particularly insulting as an Iraq war veteran, I got to serve with many, uh, you know, brave Iraqi, uh, Iraqi National Guardsmen, some of them uh, Muslim, some of them Christian, uh, but all of them helping us up in Iraq and last year, we only gave six, six uh, refugee visas to these um, you know, Iraqi citizens that had agreed to help us out. And part of that arrangement was that we would protect you by bringing you, us to bring you to the United States and your family to protect you from a lot of the revengeful elements that are in this country. And only, we only allowed six of them. That is just sad. And the only reason why uh, they're doing that is because it is a country, uh, they don't want to accept a country uh, of people uh, from the Middle East that are brown and more importantly, Muslim. That is the type of uh, real uh, prejudice and bigotry uh, that permeates through this administration. Uh, and, it, and it permeates in every aspect uh, of the government. Uh, and let's not forget, you know, at the end of the day, we all have some of the same uh, responsibilities and some of the same necessities. This president, uh, you know, given his way or not even given his way right now, is going to appoint a Supreme Court justice that's going to take away health care from millions of people across the country, including our hardworking uh, Muslim families. You know, we have uh, day in and day out assaults on working class families uh, and their ability to basically be able to sustain themselves uh, in the middle of, you know, a COVID epidemic. Uh, right now, you know, the essential workers of this world, of the country, I should say, uh, you know, come from our communities. You know, we're the doctors, we're the lawyers, we're the people that still, you know, cook and clean. Uh, and at the end of the day, there has been no respect for that community. There is no uh, pay raises coming. And more importantly, you get classified as an essential worker. And then if you don't show up because you want to protect yourself and your family, you get fired. But if you do show up, there's no health care for you. Look, good, good luck having workers comp if you're working in the wrong environment. Uh, and, you know, that is a universal problem that exists between, you know, all communities and all religions. But at the end of the day, you know, we have to, you know, deal with the core problem that, you know, this country still has, uh, you know, a problem when it comes to racism. You know, our original sin that started with, uh, you know, the slavery of our African-American brothers and sisters and then the you know, residual uh, racism uh, that became institutionalized and carries on to this day moves, has moved over to religions like uh, Muslim and Muslim people in general. Uh, and we have to fix that. We cannot be the country that we wanna be if we allow this type of prejudice to permeate. Uh, and it can't happen to any religion, can happen to any people, that, even to non-religious people. Uh, that is not the intent of the Constitution of the United States, uh, nor is it the best ability of what we can be doing as a country. Uh, so I look forward to this election clarifying what the moral standing of the United States 
is that we are a secular country that believes in religious liberty, but does not believe in religious establishments. Uh, and then more importantly, respects uh, every individual community and understands that they are a true part of the fabric of the United States. So with that, I'd love to take any questions with, with Greg and um, you know, thank you again for having me and please get out and vote. Thank you, thank you so much. We're gonna go to the questions, but before we do that, we wanted to uh, uh, allow one more speaker and He's uh, uh, Maricopa County Sheriff Paul Penzone. Uh, Sheriff Penzone issued the order to tear down Tent City, the outdoor jail, and replaced it with a drug rehabilitation center. He has also created advisory committees comprising marginalized communities. And that is so key because one of the issues involving law enforcement is we should not fear our own law enforcement. Uh, we should feel that uh, law enforcement is there to protect us. Uh, not to harm us, and and Sheriff Penzone has has done a tremendous job in breaking that uh, uh, unfortunate uh, uh, problem uh, that we see uh, on TV too much uh, in Minneapolis, uh, in Kenosha, in Atlanta, in so many other parts of the country where, and, and in Arizona, for, you know, for that matter, and here in California as well, uh, with uh, police violence against uh, people of color. So, uh, Sheriff Penzone, it's it's really an honor to have you with us tonight. Well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And, and I have to extend gratitude to both Representative Gallego and Representative Stanton, who, um, when I came into this political world, um, very naive to the process, they were both passionate fighters because they understood the impact that law enforcement had on this community in an adverse way, especially marginalized communities and the amount of work and support that they put into um, my pursuit of this office. Uh, was probably matched or ex exceeded the work into their own offices. So uh, I'm grateful to see them on this call. And I also appreciate the work they do because they are both fighters in DC. All the things that they're speaking about are the foundation of you know, our principles. It is how do we do a better job of ensuring that every aspect of legislation, whether it be writing laws or uh, moving policy, that is to the benefit of everyone, no matter what walk of life, life you come from, the foundation of our nation has to be predicated on equality, whether it is women's rights, whether it is rights for minorities, it is human rights. So it's, it's nice to be on the call and to hear them speak with such passion as they always do and put the work in. Now I will tell you this, and I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm preaching to folks who already understand this. Law enforcement in many ways has the greatest impact on quality of life when done right. When done wrong, it has the most adverse impact on quality of life for for you know, what, it, whether it's minority communities or just people in general, and the abuses and the and, and the um, just just the the flaws that are not new that are being more uh, more specifically exposed, but are not new. They have gone on for centuries. Have to be overcome. You know, law enforcement because of the authority that we carry it is a privilege. It is not an entitlement. You all give it to us, and then there's an expectation that we are guardians that we are caretakers of this power and that it is done to the benefit of those that we serve, not to the detriment. So when we see the things that go on, you know, we can talk about George Floyd, we can talk about a lot of other um, atrocities that have occurred. Those are the ones that are so extreme that everyone, when we look at those through a human eye, we understand it's unacceptable. That is law enforcement and an individual within law enforcement failing our world, not just our community, but our world. The problem lies in how do we do a better job of addressing those issues when they are not as extreme, when they're not as obvious, when they're not as exposed to ensure that we hold ourselves to a higher standard. And when we talk about these things, we talk about our world as it currently exists. Law enforcement has to be the most impartial, most objective, most compassionate and most thoughtful branch of every aspect of what is government, because we have the most direct impact on people. So whether it is someone who is a victim of a crime, someone who's a suspect of a crime, someone who is just in a circumstance where they engage in law enforcement, they should never fear us because of the badge or the color of our uniform. And we should never mistreat anyone because of the color of their skin or their religion or anything that is unique about them. So when I took this office, that was the biggest challenge. How do I change a culture and move this in the right direction so that we can be a beacon for the right reasons, not for Tent City, not for pink underwear, not for all the nonsense of the past, but actually be a a law enforcement agency that has such a strong relationship with the community that we serve, that we represent what is great about every walk of life. 
we're nowhere near our destination. We're moving in the right direction, but we need a lot of changes and we need a lot of changes in different spaces. So, you know, and I know that, you know, um, Congressman Stanton has been an advocate of this as, as have, you know, Congressman Ga uh, Gallego and Grijalva. We need immigration reform because in law enforcement, our job is to enforce the laws as they're written to be thoughtful in doing so. But if we want to be a more welcoming nation as it was predicated, you know, as a man of Italian descent, I went to Ellis Island, I, I looked at the books, I saw where my grandparents came across from Italy, from Sicily. We are all children of immigrants. So we have to do a better job of not only recognizing who we are as a nation, but fighting um, to change the laws to be more welcoming to people of all walks of life. Not predicated on what, you know, why we think you bring us value, predicated on the opportunity to deliver value. Because we all have something to offer. That in law enforcement, our job is to act on behaviors, not on colors of skin or anything else we described. Behaviors that are criminal, behaviors that are disruptive in some way that you know creates fear or violence, but to do so in a manner that we are thoughtful. So here's, I'll close with this because you know everyone else has a lot of important issues to talk about. I have impressed upon the men and women's organization and demanded that we lead with respect, that it's not something that we should expect in the community that we serve. It's something that we should deliver every time we interact with someone because how we treat others is a reflection of who we are and what our value system is. And how they respond to it is predicated on how they feel about us. But if we truly wanna see change in our community, then we should look to those who are most um, vulnerable, those who come from walks of life that are very different than our own, with the hopes that a young child, male, female, any religion, any background, looks to a man or woman in a uniform with a badge or a star and never fears that always feels as though we are the guardians to look after their best interest and to protect their families and never divide them from their own parents. That is unacceptable. It is unforgivable. It is unconstitutional. And it is something that we have to fight against. So uh, we have work to do. You, you got the right people at the table here to do it. The bottom line though is your voice is the most powerful thing that when it comes to democracy, your voice and your vote, you must do everything within your powers to ensure that that one singular vote is the drop in the water where everything ripples from it and makes change for the right reasons. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you for the, the privilege of being your sheriff, but we have a lot of work to do to change this world when, it's, when it comes from a law enforcement perspective and we cannot stop until the work is done. Thank you, thank you, Sheriff. You know, one of the great things that having this forum is getting to know each and every one of you. And uh, this is the beginning uh, of a new relationship and, and partnership with all of you uh, as we work on all the issues that were raised. Uh, we don't have that much time in, in the program, unfortunately, but we do have a few questions. Uh, one of them deals with uh, voter suppression and intimidation. How is our federal government and law enforcement for that matter going to prevent or, uh, uh, and deal with uh, voter suppression and intimidation in this election? You want to begin just from a law enforcement perspective, or was that? Uh, well, we, yeah, why don't we start with you, Sheriff, and then we'll we'll ask uh, our congressional delegation if they could pitch in as well. So there's a very fragile balance, and it's a fragile balance that historically has been abused. And and when I say this, I will tell you that you know it's interesting if you go back and, and bear with me for a moment, but if you go back to behaviors like Nazi Germany, one of the most um, impactful things that was done during that time was to utilize local law enforcement as an arm to promote the behaviors of that government, that oppressive and abusive and murderous government. So when it comes to our democracy, law enforcement needs to understand the neutrality that we must um, abide by, yet while still providing protections. So when it, when it comes to any aspect that could be criminal in nature, and I'll talk just right at the, right at the polls, what we don't wanna see are men and women in uniform who stand at the polls and intimidate anyone from feeling it's an uncomfortable space to cast their vote. That is unacceptable. But what we also need to do is to make sure that when anyone goes to the polls, they should not fear that someone is going to try to intimidate, uh, use violence or anything at all to deter them from casting their vote because it is in opposition to someone who, who uses violence for their benefit. So what we have done in our offices, I have designated uh, two deputy teams in volume and their job is to be responsible for a particular region. And they will drive around in unmarked cars and unmarked um, clothes, but they will be present to look after voters to make sure it's a safe space and they'll go from location to location. And if they see something that they believe is voter oppression or intimidation, first thing we'll do is we'll contact the local law enforcement agency so that they can um, act appropriately to address it. But if they're not uh, immediately accessible, 
then our deputies will identify themselves and make sure that we protect everyone and everyone's rights, first from violence, but as importantly, to ensure that their vote is protected. So we'll be out there. We will be um, ready to act as is necessary and appropriate, but we are not going to be a visible, visual deterrent because we don't want anyone steering away from the voter box because they fear that law enforcement is present. And I'll, I'll just jump in and add on that one uh, that uh, I think the sheriff has it exactly right. Uh, unfortunately, the president of the United States has kind of called out his supporters to come to the polls and I believe insinuated that they should try to intimidate voters. In some cases, the concern is that people will bring weapons to the poll. Fortunately, in Arizona, it is illegal. We're one of the states where it's actually illegal to bring a weapon, including a, um, uh, a firearm, to the polls. That being said, there are other ways to potentially intimidate voters. The problem, as the sheriff mentioned, is we don't want to preempt that by having law enforcement at the polls because that in and of itself could create an intimidating environment for some that would choose not to participate in the election. So striking this balance, and I trust that Sheriff Penzone is gonna strike the right balance and the, and the other local jurisdictions on uh, election day, but this ain't easy. This is not gonna be easy if unfortunately there may be some who will, will try to actually physically show up at the polls and engage in any level of, uh, uh, of voter intimidation. Now you mentioned voter suppression. Sadly, in this country, uh, there seems to be this divide between the parties. Um, obviously, this is my interpretation of it, but I do believe it's backed up with a lot of facts that in general, the Democratic Party wants to make it as easy as possible to vote. In fact, we, we voted to make Election Day a national holiday and we want automatic voter registration and same day registration. We want to eliminate as many restrictions as possible so that as many Americans that can uh, uh, participate in the election that can appropriately participate in can do. The other side seems to be stuck on this idea that they've got to shrink the electorate, that their political success will be based on shrinking the, uh, uh, shrinking the electorate and making it hard to vote. Things like clearing out voter rolls uh, or making it hard to like do signature or strong signature verification. Some even require you have um, a witness uh, to sign your, your ballot um, in, before you could actually mail your ballot back in to make it harder for people to participate. We, you know, I just disagree with all of that. But this particular election, there is a unique threat. And the president has unfortunately like flagged this over and over and over again. And that is, he is trying to suggest that mail-in ballots are somehow less viable or even potentially more suspect. And the concern is, is that shortly after election day, even though in Arizona, we're used to this, we're used to sticking around for a week or two after the elections and continue to count votes, that the president may try to cut off the counting of properly submitted mail-in ballots, not only in Arizona, but around the country. And it is so important that we fight, not just for every person to participate in the election, but then that every rightfully submitted ballot gets counted, even, even if it's after, especially if it's after election day. And I don't partic I particularly, I don't put a high priority on how quickly that needs to be done. I put a higher priority on ensuring that every uh, appropriately submitted ballot is counted. And if it takes a while for, because there was such great turnout and you know it just took a while to count all the ballots, let's take the time necessary. We are not going to allow uh, this president or anyone else to try to work with elections officials that uh, share his political belief around the country to somehow stop counting ballots before every single ballot is counted. And that's a form of voter suppression and we're not gonna allow that. We're gonna fight like heck to make sure that that doesn't occur in this upcoming election. If it takes a little longer, it takes a little longer. It's more important that every ballot be counted. Thank you, and, 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 and uh, Congressman Staten, we understand that your wife had surgery and you were watching her and, and still able to make the program. So we really appreciate it and pray for her speedy recovery. Thank you for uh, saying that. I saw the comment from my good friend, Muhammad in the, uh, in the comments of Muhammad. Thank you for being so supportive of me and my family. 
for so many years. I know your wife went through some serious health issues not too long ago, and we still pray for her. And I know you're returning the favor and sending my wife prayers. She The, the surgery was successful, but still very painful right now. <laughs> She's going through that painful process of recovery. And Congressman Gr Grijalva, if you could close it out for us and, you know, democracy is about is democracy is about a peaceful transition of power and there's talk about uh, the president if if he loses will not leave the office How, I, 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 th go I, ahead. Think the, I think I think the mayor's laid it out well the the, the scenario I, 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 I really think that there's going to be some effort on his part to clean to try to clean to try to use uh, uh, the judicial system as a buffer to try to change an outcome. Uh, I'm, and I think there's been preparation all along for that fight, as, as, as the mayor said. Uh, so there, there could be some legal ramifications. And a lot of the voter suppression tactics that have been legislated in various states have already been done. And we're having to slug through those at now. I think uh, the, the next Congress and the next administration need to, uh, to update and uh, the Voting Rights Act, uh, strengthen it, making voting more accessible to people and, uh, and get that passed and signed into law. But uh, I also think that I also have this sense and, and call me a, a, an eternal optimist, you know? <laughs> yeah, my, my wife says I'm an optimist and a masochist too. So there's some kind of bad combination there. But- uh, <laughs> You go hand in hand. <laughs> <laughs> I think so in, in this business. And uh, I, I really think that, that if, if the voters of this country send a resounding message nationwide and in the state of Arizona, uh, that all those other shenanigans will be irrelevant, irrelevant. So back to the voting, then back all to the, the, the urgency about that. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you all for energizing the vote. God bless all of you. And, and uh, as you. you look at this point, uh, as a beginning of a new relationship with all of you. So thank you very much. Now I'll, I'll give it back to Iman. And if there's a survey for uh, our participants. Uh, vote, uh, vote, vote, vote. Don't hesitate, go vote. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good Iman. one. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you, Senator Stanton. You exactly what I was gonna say. Um, he, he took the words right out of my mouth. So, you know, when it comes down to it, folks, it's on us. It's on the Ummies and the Babas and the Mamus and the Chachus. You know, even ask your Jiddas and your Dadajans to show up to vote if, if we need to. You know, what so many people think is merely ink and pen when it comes to our ballot, um, fail to recognize that it's actually a prescription for our future. It's a booming sentiment. It's a first time echo. It's a decision and one we must pursue boldly. Whether this is your first time voting or one of many times, whether you're voting in your pajama pants or a Phoenix Suns jersey, recognize the responsibility that your vote, vote voice holds in forging what the future looks like for all of us and recognize the power your vote holds and, and who wins when you decide to give that superpower away. I wanna thank our dear grassroots partner, the Arizona Muslim Alliance, Muhammad al Shark. Sure, and all of the leaders on this call today. You make us all so, so proud and hopeful for the future that is to come. To our viewers, if you have any questions or concerns regarding how to vote, when to vote, any kind of protocols or, or resources that you may need, you can find all of this at IWillVote.com or TTF.com forward slash voting. Go there for all of your voting info. Again, Thank you for spending the afternoon with us. We are so, so appreciative of your support. Thank you to all who are the, the leaders on these calls. We, we cannot thank you enough. And may we all have a very safe and exciting um, election kind of voting process. Make sure to get out and vote everybody. And thank you all so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your night. Bye -bye. Thank you.